welcome back to the It's Too Late show. I'm your host, Kalua Lua. Let's introduce our guest for tonight. You know her from the MLC, a Niv expert, and now one of the new casters for Eminence Gaming. It's Shauna. Hey, Shauna, thanks for joining us. I went zero and nine in the MLC. I should have asked you to take that out in post. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not all, all right. your fault. You were. <laughs> A replacement, so... Yeah, yeah. I was hoping people would forget about that, but, you know, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> how, was your, uh, how was your drive across country? Did you... Uh... So, no one that I know of got injured. Um, I'm at the amount of accidents that I shouldn't be allowed on the road anymore, but... Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I watched the entire... I rewatched the entirety of Avatar The Last Airbender on the way down, mm -hmm. and on the way back, I just did nothing. So, you know, it was pretty boring, but... We made how it. many uh how many days did you do it in three so okay. on the way i did three and i made it like stops at hotels and i was very smart about it but on the yeah. way back i was like you know what i don't want to take it like in three days so i did in like a, a day and a half and slept in my yeah. car <laughs> it was really great <laughs> yeah nice let's start with your most recent event how was uh chaos four for you today so Chaos 4 was really interesting to me today. I had my first game ever where I didn't recognize any of the commanders. I was playing against Jetmir, House of Revels, something like that, and I was playing against the new Joda, mm -hmm. um, which is ridiculous, by the way. And I was playing against whoever the last one was. I'm blanking on it. But it was basically three creatures. Oh, Gattatig. It was Gattatig. I've never oh, played really? against a Gattatig <laughs> oh, deck in my entire life. I've been so fortunate. Yeah. And... I sat down and I was like, okay, so this is just three creature decks and I'm going to kill myself. And then I immediately get Thorn of Amethyst did yeah. by by the Gaddic T player. And I'm like, okay, well, my my spells are useless. And uh, it was it was pretty annoying. Pretty annoying. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of that. A lot of, um, a lot of creature heavy decks, which I don't do very well against. I have, I have the occasional bounce spells, but creature heavy decks always have some kind of early stacks that lands faster than I can land Niv, so there's yeah. always like a collector oof here or there that prevents me from... My entire Niv package is artifact-based, so if you have any kind of null rod or oof effect, I am doing nothing that entire game. Mm -hmm. And Niv is my only way to get rid of creatures, and they were all creature-based, so yeah, I died yeah. I died to many a warrior, many a Najila, and many a Winota, for sure. Mm -hmm. How'd yours go? Let's see, I went one loss and two draws, and then I dropped from the tournament, so... That was me, too. Uh, that was me. I could have won one of them. There was an oof in play and a graph digger's cage, and I tried to breach, so I I cast Chain of Vapor on the uh, the graph digger's cage, and then, and then I cast Breach, and then I was like, oh, I'll replay Chain of Vapor from my graveyard to get rid of the oof, but then... I only had uh, I had a swan song to uh, protect it, but it wasn't enough. So I uh, tried to come up with some other line, fumbled for about 20 minutes, and was like, well, <laughs> I just lost this game. So Was it the oof player who stopped you from removing the oof, or was it a different player? It was a different player. Okay. It was uh, a Malcolm Tana, maybe? Yeah. It sucks to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I had a similar issue where I was using a Chain of Vapor to both bounce my own Dockside to go from 3 treasures to like 11 to cast Niv, mm -hmm. and sacrifice the Gemstone Caverns, obviously colorless mana I don't need, to uh, copy the Chain of Vapor through a Rule of Law and bounce my opponent's Dranith Magistrate. But they yeah. had uh, like Brave the Tides or Brave the Elements or something like that. Something that chooses a color and gives creatures of your creatures that you own protection from that color. And uh -huh. it was a Winota deck who was just like randomly run running this white protection card that I've never <laughs> seen before. And I was like, yeah. what are the odds of that? And then I go to uh, later when I'm getting lethaled by uh, Winota and this other thing that's like, it's like four white or red pips and it gives attacking creatures you control double strike and you just Winota mm -hmm. trigger it in. And yeah, I was trying yeah. to, I was trying to kill it, and he had Tybalt's trickery, and I'm just like, you have the nuts, like you have two <laughs> pieces of interaction in your deck, and you drew both of them. I'm so happy for you, but also, yeah. it was quite upsetting. <laughs> so, since you're kind of known as a Niv player, that's me. Is it okay if we kind of look at your your deck list and Absolutely. kind of do a, a deck check? Sounds good. I'll put it up on the screen for the people watching this. Great. Let's go over your creatures. Sure. The one that sticks out for me is the Goblin Matron. 
what are your your thoughts on on playing that to get the uh, the dock side out? Yeah, it's done nothing but overperform for me. Uh, there used to be um, there used to be even more of a dock side package in here when I had Goblin Recruiter out, but mm -hmm. Re Recruiter obviously is meant for more of a snoop line, and it also puts it to top instead yeah. of into your hand. Mm -hmm. So uh, while I do like that for you know, if if you tutor something to your hand and your opponent sees it and attempts to wheel you out of it, Goblin Recruiter does get around that, but there's I almost never get wheeled in CDH in general, just because they're so taboo at this point. Yeah. Um, and it's just not a, it's not a likelihood for a reason to keep it in. And I have never lost it out of my hand since I put it in, and I have very rarely had people play around it because of the like despite the fact that they know it's in my hand so mm -hmm. it's always been a really easy um two colorless mana tutor i almost always have the uh mana crypt to cast it or I always have some kind of rock out by then some kind mm -hmm. of like a uh, talisman or something that can tap for colorless pretty easily and uh, yeah the idea is land niv turn three or four at the latest and Goblin Matron mm -hmm. definitely gets you there. It consistently gets cast on turn two, and it's very nice. Cool, cool. Uh, your sorceries, they all look pretty standard for is it spells. I'd say so. Um, your instants? They're numerous. <laughs> delayed Blast Fireball, how's that been for you? Oh, it has... It stopped, it stopped me from losing today to Najila because it just completely ruins Najila and Winota for that, for that matter, kind of, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um... I've often uh, foretold it to get rid of a Tricky Krom or a Najil or a Winota or something like that. Anything that's bigger than the standard two that won't get killed by the first one is definitely getting mm -hmm. killed by the second one. Uh, I've foretold it. Um, it's, it is a little pricey. It's one less mana than Psychrift mana, and it is two red. But yeah. um, if I'm in the situation where I need to be doing it, I, I basically have to cast the man. I have to use the man anyway, so I'm just grateful that this mode is possible. Mm -hmm. But um, before this, I was on Flame Sweep, and while it is easier to cast at two colorless and a red, it is much more versatile, and I've never had the, uh, like the clause of dealing two damage to each creature except for creatures I control with flying. I don't have any creatures I control with flying except for Niv, and he's not dying to a flame sweep anyway. So yeah. it's just like an additional text that kind of helps helps the player or helps the caster in that scenario where it's never come in handy for me. So Blade Blast Fireball, the red's never an issue for me, or it hasn't been yet, uh, crossing my fingers, but it's always <laughs> been, it's always overperformed. And not to mention that I'm against so many Blue Farm Mad Nas decks that sometimes just foretelling four or five and being able to do five to every opponent is so easy. I've killed people with lightning bolts before, and this mm -hmm. is just a better lightning bolt. Another one that I've started seeing popping up in a couple lists is slip out the back. The phase out, how's that, how's that been for you? So I've never been in a situation where phasing out a creature uh, on my opponent's end is a super bad thing. It's always a downside that I will 100% 100 take in a heartbeat. If I am slipping it out of the back, it is because they are winning on the spot, it's a Derevi or whatever, and mm -hmm. it is giving us uh, another turn to deal with it. Uh, I've slipped out the back cricks before. Anything that's immediately comes down and gets real super scary, and I need another turn to either get Niv out and then have abilities to kill it permanently, or mm -hmm. I just need to get it off the field so that my opponents have a turn to tech for it. Um, but more often than that than not, it is being used on Niv as protection. I have okay. very little ways um, other than my free counter spells and my free deflecting spot. Obviously, I have misdirection here and there, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But other than my free ways to protect Niv, but the turn that I play him is the most uh, is the most vulnerable. If I can untap with Niv out, I have a forty percent chance of winning the game. So just keeping uh, free protection out as cheap as possible or free or close to free protection as soon as possible is the best because normally if i have resolved a jeweled lotus or dockside i am using six mana to cast niv and hopefully only have one or one or two maybe left over to protect him with and yeah, yeah. slip on the back is is pretty prime yeah you uh with niv you want a lot of, of free spells to keep the stack going if you need to Totally. And this um, is not relevant, but it also makes him a 6-6 six, six and turns him from a 5-turn commander clock to a 4-turn commander clock, so I've nice. never killed somebody that way, but <laughs> it's kind of nice. 
Yeah. The the kind of the last instant that is maybe a little different from other lists is Balakut Awakening. Yep. Modal dual face yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually uh, just top 16 uh, ca the cash card tournament with this card, and mm -hmm. I top 16 with another Niv deck who was asking me about this in Time Twister, and he was like, three mana is kind of steep, do you ever find a hard time affording this or anything like that? And uh, yeah, if you, if you draw it early game and you don't find yourself, you almost never need to wheel early game unless you are really looking for something to stop your opponents from winning, but mm -hmm. it's almost always a land for me if I see it in an opener. Uh, but more often than not, I see it late game when I totally have the mana to cast it. It is there for a self-wheel and gives me the cards that I could need to, again, free counterspell a removal spell for Niv, or it gives me usually an average of six or seven damage to kill a problem creature, mm -hmm. and nobody ever sees it coming. Obviously, um... Wheels in this deck are extremely powerful, which is why I run Time Twister as my only way to shuffle the deck. But yeah. um, it's really a way for me to see a new hand, wheel my library, get the damage off Niv, get a ridiculous damage off Niv, all while uh, replacing the cards in my library in case I need them to curiosity kill the table. So, as you can see, I do not have a shuffler of any kind. Time Twister is my only way to shuffle my library in, so... Mm -hmm. Keeping those cards in my library, despite the fact that I don't need them, is pretty prime. Most of the rest of the list is pretty... Uh, nothing really stands out too much. Uh, I am uh, running Jeweled Lotus. This is really weird in some circles. Uh, it's just oh. a good card in general. Uh, a lot of people think that I should take it out because it's just not worth the zero mana, but I just disagree with those people. Uh, Jeweled Lotus? Just, yeah, they're just really unintelligent. <laughs> I'm super <laughs> fucking like, kidding. Absolutely I'm like, not. Uh, that's probably like your best artifact. Yeah. No, it's just it's a really fringe card. You really have yeah. to know the deck to know when to play it. I it's too expensive. I usually just run like something probably something <laughs> Some, cheaper. Something that's oh expensive <laughs> money wise, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pentad Prism's kind of a house. I haven't seen a lot of people run Pentad Prism, but it's yeah. uh it's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. You just kind of recycle your your colored mana for later. Is there anything else that you really like about the deck that you want to share with people who are listening? Uh, other than the fact that it's just, once uh, once he lands, I'm very, very confident in the fact that it is one of the most meta-breaking commanders in the current meta. It mm -hmm. is technically, uh, it's gotten a lot of uh, f infamy from the fact that it's on the database, but I really didn't see a lot of decks I was actually surprised to see a total of four Niv decks at the CCU tournament, but it is hard to get out because it is a casual costing card. It is six red pips or uh, six colored pips, but once mm -hmm. it is out, it completely warps the CDH format because everything is killable and everything is one or two usually Niv pings away from getting killed. So if you're yeah. ever on the fence about getting into CDH or you just don't find yourself uh, connecting to any decks that are out there, you think they're all ad nauseum piles, or they're all peer into the abyss piles that are too complicated and you don't know your breach lines, please go for a div it. It is a completely, it runs itself, you just get to draw a bunch of cards and get a bunch of triggers, you get to be involved in the game in a way that other commanders don't let you, and you just get to play a big dragon and swing at people. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot of Malcolm decks have started playing it in the 99 just because it's, uh, once you get it out, you win the game. So. Oh, I'm aware. <laughs> I've been, I have been, ugh, I've seen so many Malcolm Niv Mizzets from yeah. either Neoforms or Magda or they, something, or Magda or something like that. Yeah. I almost got Magda today, but my trusty Graf Digger's cage stopped from happening. So. Nice. Very fun. Nice. Very cool and fun. Let's go back a little bit in time. You talked about the King Cash Clash, the rumble across from Benihana Jungle. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm talking <laughs> about the uh, the Black Lotus CEDH tournament. That's the one. I heard uh, you did pretty well on that. How did it How did it go? Yeah, I uh, I got top 16. I and I went into top 16 with a 3-2-1 uh, record, and mm -hmm. they did the same thing that we saw today at the Sad Nos tournament, where you get five points for a win and one point for a draw. And so I was 16 points going into the final. I was fourth seed, and mm -hmm. uh, with the with the guys or with the 
tournament prizing the way it was. Obviously, being higher in seed really benefited you because if you get to time t uh, top four pod, whoever wins gets the gets the black lotus. But then it goes in seeding from there, so mm -hmm. it keeps you from getting that imperial seal. But I got into my top sixteen game. I was playing against uh, Malk or sorry, Thrasios, Rograk, Polytyrant. I was playing against Timna Thrasios, Timna Thrasios, and I was playing against Brago. And um, at one point, they had all resolved a Rhystic Study, and I had resolved Niv. So mm -hmm. there was a couple of turns towards the end of the game, I think the last three turns, where we had an average of 20 cards in, a, in everyone's hand. And it was a pretty ridiculous game. One that you'd, like, <laughs> every single turn a win was presented because everybody had their deck in their hand. Yeah. And then it finally got around to me, and I resolved the Tandem Lookout and completely punted. I um, resolved Tandem Lookout immediately. I must have thought for an instant um, that Niv had summoning sickness and then I couldn't swing with it. And so I said, main phase two. And then I said, fuck, wait. Can I go back, please? Like, I need, I need to go back to combat and win the game. And obviously yeah. the table knows this. And then the judge said, no, you cannot. You can't go back to... Uh, can't go back to combat despite uh, that no despite the uh, fact that no information has been revealed which i've since uh, been told that i should have appealed that decision mm -hmm. and uh not only should you not mistake make the mistake in the first place but you should really find out what the head judge will say even if you're fairly confident that the uh the judge is correct i would always take the time to call the head judge just to see what their perspective of the game is and what they believe uh, a magic player has the right to do in any given C comp REL game. Because mm -hmm. um, Libby was actually the head judge uh, and he was really interesting in his calls. I didn't disagree with any of them, but they were definitely uh, maybe out of the ordinary in what he let happen and what he didn't let happen. For example, mm -hmm. there was a Captain Sis, or, I'm sorry, Sis, a Weatherlight Captain deck attempting to win with uh, Selvala, Heart of the Wilds, and Emil. And okay. he tapped uh, Selvala, Heart of the Wilds, using all of his mana, all of his available mana at the time, to pay the green with a city brass and tap Selvala. And he said, with Sisse on field, I'm going to make Wooburg, because I have, Selvala is, or Sisse is five power, is my highest power, I'm going to make Wooburg. And we all agreed on it, because it makes sense, because it's a Sisse activation. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to cast Emil. And we're like, with what? Double white. And he's like, oh, well, fuck. I, I, meant, I knew I was casting a meal. I meant to make double white and then whatever other colors. And we're like, well, you, you did already attempt to cast a meal with mana that you didn't have. So we don't think that you're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. He calls over a judge. Judge says, hold on a minute. Let me consult with my fellow other judge. But I'm 90% sure that you can't take it back. He goes to check, comes back and says, sorry, boss, you can't can't take that back you can't read name mana especially since you've already presented the table with additional information being that you're trying to cast a meal mm -hmm. and so he was like would you like to appeal that decision and he says sure why not i might as well and libby comes over and after a lot of deliberation he ends up saying you know what we are all intelligent magic players we all have we all have our uh, best kind of line in mind he knew that he was going to cast a meal and he just misspoke we are all intelligent magic players. I'm going to let him take back a meal and re-declare his mana. Um, hmm. Especially since the table has not presented any extra information. So, in in that case, I would definitely would have thought that he would be shit out of luck because he has presented extra information. And in yeah. my case, I didn't. So, because uh, it would be a different story if I had moved to main phase 2 and my opponent had said, well, in response, I'm going to kill Niv. Or in response, yeah. I'm going to kill yeah, Tim yeah. Lookout but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, always ask your judges. Were there any prizes for the place that you got in the tournament? Unfortunately not. They were uh. definitely, they were, to they were tossing around ideas, uh, but I kind of like the fact that they kept it to just the top four because mm -hmm. the top four prizes were ridiculous. I mean, you had a Imperial Seal as the fourth um, option, and then as the third option, you still had a Judge Promo Gaia's Cradle, a $3,000 card, with some extra, like, Ikoria booster boxes or something like that. And then you had the um, Time Twister, along with a bunch of other cool goodies. And then you mm -hmm. had the Black Lotus. So it's a 
I want to say it's the most prize support I've ever seen in a tournament. I can't name anything that has been close to it. And because of the turnout, they're going to continue to uh, make tournaments like that with Frank and Sons. So it's pretty exciting. I think, yeah, for prize support, that's probably <laughs> the craziest uh, prizes that I've, I've ever seen. So. Yeah, and it was big enough to have 110 people say, you know what, I'm willing to pay $300 to try to get up there, you know? Mm -hmm. And there were some people that definitely weren't uh, like avid CEDH players. There were some people that were just bringing their best casual deck, and there were some people that were bringing a CEDH deck shell, but were, bo but were running like Bow of Nylia in their Captain Sisse deck, you know, sort of yeah. things. So, you know, everybody definitely wanted a shot at it, but they were going about it in really different ways, which was really exciting to see. Uh, let's go back even further in time. Uh, we hinted at it a little bit earlier. Uh, you took part in the MLC, Major League Commander, run yes, by Callahan from the Mind Sculptors. Yes, sir. You said you went 0 and 9? How, uh... I went 0, 9, and 1. 0, 9, <laughs> yeah. and 1. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, yeah. what decks did you have available to, so to play? So I had, uh, I'm just gonna look it up real quick. Mm -hmm. Um... I knew I had four color farm, which was mm -hmm. uh, Timna and Krom, and I had four color uh, mid range, which was Timna Tana, and mm -hmm. then I had yep, I had uh, Rakdos World Lord Dragon, which was Croxa Titan of World Hunger or Titan of Death Hunger, and I had yeah. Rixus Wizards, which was an Ala. So uh, I ended up I actually didn't draft these decks. I ended up taking over another player's decks when they had dropped after the first week. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, despite what they were trying to do to help me kind of fudge the rules a little bit, I wasn't able to change a single card in their list. So I'm oh. pretty sure uh, Tim Nakram was running like Embercleave or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, things that I just wasn't sure about. But other than the occasional card here and there, which I can tell maybe was a pet card or a certain include based on the meta, they were pretty mm -hmm. solid decks. I mean, they're pretty solid lists. Um, it was have you kind of, have you played any of those before? I had never played any of those before. <laughs> so I immediately got into it and I was like, I have seen these decks win, I have played against these decks, but obviously nothing prepares you for actually having to present win with a deck that you have no idea what it's doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely meant to practice more with them, but that didn't happen. So, um, yeah, I went into most games uh, kind of doing my best in terms of I know that this is the correct value play, and this is the, for any deck, this play would get me the most cards, or this would get me, this would set my opponents the most behind. Uh, mm -hmm. So if I play like this, um, I am guaranteed to further my board state, or so on and so forth. But mm -hmm. uh, when it came to accruing value was easy, since that's pretty simple in Magic. But when it came to actually like running through breach lines, I have no clue what I'm doing. So if anything, I'm pretty grateful for it because it gave me a lot of knowledge that I needed to kind of... Like, I, didn't, I had no idea how an Allo won before. I just knew that it was bad. And I knew that it was like going to present a win very early. But mm -hmm. when it came to the actual Spellseeker line, I was completely clueless. <laughs> yeah, that's and tough. Yeah, and uh, it just gives you a lot of perspective that I wouldn't have had had I just drafted a bunch of decks that I was familiar with. So mm -hmm. uh, I definitely didn't l win a single game because I had no clue what I was doing. But now I do. I know <laughs> exactly how all of these decks win, and I know what their what their game plan is. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, four-color mid-range basically can't win without creatures on board it needs to it needs something to farm and four color farm needs something to farm it needs something to sack and keep the keep the um the ad noise or peer into the abyss available and four color mid range just like dylan from play to wins blood pod needs something to neoform or not neoform needs something to breeding pool or ship away in some kind and inala needs three mana and a spell seeker <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh and world guard dragon is ridiculously easily interrupted you can just completely yeah, fuck that's, yourself <laughs> uh, it's a dangerous line to to play with the yeah, world guard dragon it, it's very cool it's not it's not it's not something i not, i ever would have chose because i'm not somebody who goes out of my comfort zone very often but mm -hmm. i would definitely uh encourage people to proxy up and try their own try different decks 
especially if it's something that you would completely avoid um, mm -hmm. at most occasions. If it's something that your meta presents continuously and you have no idea what it's doing except for like a faint inkling, proxy up the deck and give it a try because it playing the deck and struggling through it yourself and struggling to find the win really helps you helps you be confident playing against them in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that can really help your threat assessment is uh, playing all different types of decks so you know what to look out for, what kind of combo they're putting together, and, and what's coming next. Yeah, there was a game that I played with Dylan's Blood Pod where I had wiped his board thoroughly with Nymph Triggers, and I was still pinging his face because I was so terrified of Blood Pod's overall explosiveness and, conti uh, like, ability to continue to present a win. So I was just pinging his face trying to kill him. Meanwhile, <laughs> Modnan was over there on Cody, just like breaching me into oblivion. And I'm like, oh, so now I know if Dylan has, on Blood Pod, has no creatures on the field, I have literally nothing to worry about because he cannot win. <laughs> yeah. So I should have been pointing those triggers somewhere else <laughs> and possibly killing Dan. Yep, always kill Dan first. Always kill Dan. So you are now a caster for Eminence Gaming. How, That's me. How did that come to be? So I think uh, it started when CVH dad Mike uh, was hosting Punt City, and mm -hmm. I was obviously still living in L.A., uh, trying to make things work with L.A. rent. Uh, so he contacted me and was like, hey, we really want to get you out for our first event. It's Punt City. It's super fun. We want you to bring Niv and, you know, have a good time. And I was like, holy shit, this is such an honor. Like, he was yeah. willing to, like, help me find rooming and or boarding, stuff like that. Um, but I was like, there's just no way I can make this happen. It's like a $500 plane ticket alone to get across the country. Yeah. And uh, I was just really busy with work at the time, so I just couldn't pull it together. And he was like, no problem. Let's see you at the next one. We're hoping to host some West Coast events next year, 2023. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely get you to those. And it was a really nice introduction from somebody that was just trying to get their tournament on the map and they more than did that with punt city mm -hmm. um so then mike later actually reached out to me thinking that i was with the knowledge that i was still with command zone and said hey we we're looking for a caster to uh host some uh tournaments next year an average of four to five mm -hmm. uh tournaments a year would you like to cast for this um and we know that your relationship with Wizards is, you know, up in the air because you work with Command Zone and you may not be able to work with us because of your because of our use of proxies. So mm -hmm. we completely understand that uh, that may bar you from doing so. And I'm like, yeah, it would have. If I was still with Command Zone and I wasn't currently on the path to leaving, I would definitely not be able to work with you. But because of this random, not well, random, kind of like perfectly timed decision to distance myself from Command Zone, I was able to work with Eminence. So that was like... A kind of the best of bad situation kind of thing. So I really was happy to hear from them. And Mike is an awesome guy. And as much as, much as I don't like to say it, Mikey and Zane are good too. So <laughs> yeah, fine. You, you got to watch out for the cabal that uh, they're running over there. It's a cult. It's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I'm not with them. <laughs> <laughs> yet. Yet. You're not with them yet. We'll be right back after these messages to see if Shauna can become a Kaluanair. So stick around. Yeah. 